Now, it is time to start our first session of day two of our Open Science Conference. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, our, our first speaker, Joschka Zellinger, and he'll be talking about data tracking and research, academic freedom at risk, question mark. Joschka, are you there? Hi, David, I'm there. Very good. Hi, everyone. I'm doing good, thank you very much. Before I uh, do a quick review of your resume, which is very impressive, I just wanted to know where are you currently sitting? Um, I'm sitting in my office um, based in Berlin with a nice uh, sunshine in my office. Very good. I commented uh, yesterday as well. I'm outside of Hamburg. And after many weeks, the sun has finally decided to come back here in northern Germany. So we have a little bit of positive news in, in these very tough times. But I'm glad to hear that. Good, Yashka. I'd like to briefly introduce you. Yashka Zellinger is an attorney at law and fundamental rights activist at the Gesellschaft for Freiheitsrechte, which is the Society for Civil Rights here in Berlin, or there in Berlin, should I say. His work focuses on strategic litigation in the field of intellectual property rights and conflicts with civil liberties. As everything becomes more and more digital, there are advantages as well as disadvantages that come along with this. Yashka will discuss the impact that the tracking of individual research may have on academic freedom and the right to international self-determination with the aim to protect sensitive data and engage in the debate on research tracking. It is my pleasure to welcome Yashka Zellinger and to learn more about his topic, data tracking and research, academic freedom at risk. And with that, it's our tradition Yashka, that we do a round of applause, even if we're at home or in our offices. The digital floor is yours, please. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks, David, for this very um, good and precise introduction. And that gives me the opportunity just to jump right into it. As David has mentioned, the topic of my talk today is data tracking in research and the fundamental rights implications of these practices, namely on the right to data protection and the right to informational or international self-determination, which includes the right to data protection. Um, in this talk, I will demonstrate how current practices of data collecting in the context of scientific research can impair these fundamental rights and what we can do about it. So, mostly when we talk about the role of um, big data and sciences, we talk about, open, uh, about big data as the object of research in the sense that researchers use big data, uh, the chances, chances or methods like um, text and data mining, or from a regulatory perspective, how can we make sure that researchers have access to data or how can we make sure that this data and findings of data related research remain accessible and can be distributed and so further and so on. Um, so in this context, big data certainly holds a great potential for research. However, it becomes more problematic when the researchers themselves become the object of big data. Björn Brems and other researchers have described this in an opinion piece for, the, um, for a German newspaper as uh, how does it feel when you yourself become the lab rat? And this is what this talk is about, namely the question how and to which extent researchers are currently being tracked by academic publishers and research institutions, and especially about the fundamental rights impact and what the role of publicly funded research institutions should be. So how does this relate to GFF, GFS work? Um, as David had mentioned, um, GFF is a human rights litigation organization and our work focuses uh, on four thematic areas um, you can see here. And um, areas one and two are enabling space for civil society and data and surveillance. And we're working to defend constitutional and human rights in these areas and do this mostly through strategic litigation. That means we bring um, cases to court. Um, we do also um, constitutional complaints. And thirdly, we engage in legal, uh, we engage in social debates with legal opinions. Research tracking connects to these areas one and two, because firstly, academic freedom and free independent sciences are a vital part of our democratic society. Secondly, data collection that involves state actors, which universities are, if they're publicly funded, falls directly into our area two, um, data and surveillance. So my approach to this topic is not a descriptive point of view, but rather um, the anger to explore how and which legal remedies could be strategically used to curb the negative impact on fundamental rights of these practices. So um, when people think of academic publishers, most of them may think of their traditional role as publishers, printing actual books or journals, 
um, or that publicists make sure that research findings can be published and distributed all over the world. But as we all know, in academic publishing, this has not been the case for some time. What maybe not everyone knows is that companies that are active in the field of academic publishing, especially the large ones, even no longer refer to themselves as publishers. Here you can see um, the self-description of Elsevier, one of the largest academic publishers, which um, who describe themselves as a leader in information and analytics for customers across the global research and health ecosystems. So even them do not refer to themselves as publishers any longer. Um, so these companies have pushed publishing itself to the background. And as we know, academic publishers have made substantial, uh, have made substantial profits over the past decades, and we're able to use these to open up and explore other business areas, also to get ahead of open access, and they have found new ways to make themselves, again, indispensable for research and researchers. I will demonstrate this with um, two graphics that I have taken from the article Inequalities in Knowledge Production by uh, Alejandro Posada and George Cheng. And here in the first picture, you can see the research cycle as described by Posada and Cheng that consists of three phases. The research itself, the publishing process, and the research evaluation process. So this um, picture covers the whole research cycle from the research question to uh, the publication process up until the evaluation and pertaining uh, evaluation, um, which and, and the decisions pertaining to the employment of uh, researchers and promotion decisions and so on. And in this picture, you can see that the traditional role of publishers is limited to the publication process itself and consists in the traditional public publishing services such as uh, pro editing, proofing, uh, organizing a peer review, and the actual um, publication and distribution. This has, um, however, substantially changed. What you can see here, and you don't have to look at it in every detail, are all platf platforms, services, and businesses that um, Relex, um, formerly known as Reed Elsevier, Elsevier's parent company, has acquired over the past 10 years or so. And what you can clearly see is that this data analytics business, Relex, um, formerly, publisher, formerly publisher, is engaged all over and in every step of the research, research cycle. For example, um, as an electronic laboratory documentation tool, Hivebench, you can see here, was acquired in 2016 by Ben Reed Elsevier. For the management of citations and um, research results, Mendeley um, had been acquired in 2013. For the publication also of preprints, uh, SSRN belongs to Relix uh, since 2016. And even in the evaluation process, for example, for research metrics, Elsevier had acquired Plum in, in analytics in 2017. Um, what is especially problematic about this new business model is that it doesn't stop here. Companies as Relix are selling the data that is generated through these platforms and which is based on the behavior of the researchers. Um, and they resell this data back to the universities in aggregated forms, for example, for their research management systems or platforms such as Pure, which had also been acquired by Reed Elsevier in 2012. So in the past, researchers may have criticized about the publisher's business model that one had, had to pay for the research that oneself had created. Now, the business model of large academic publishers resembles um, that of Google or Facebook or Meta, as it's now called, where um, one can say that you don't pay for the product because you are the product yourself, meaning that users agree to hand over their personal data to these companies to fuel their ad-based business models. Now, in the case of academic publishing, it's even worse. You could say that you are the product and you are paying for it. Um, maybe not quite the optimal situation. And it goes even further. So, um, companies such as Relex and Thomson Reuters are not only active in the field of academia. For example, Relex is not only the parent company of Elsevier. Relex also know, uh, owns LexisNexis, a um, data analytics um, provider, which also provides an anti-fraud tool called Threat Metrics. Threat Metrics is a tool for the authentication of users and devices. For example, if you have ever logged um, into a website you normally use, but you do so from a hotel or from a coffee shop, the browser, the browser might ask you for a secondary level of authentication, such as two-factor authentication via your cell phone or email, and that is something that Threat Metrics would, could, could do. Now, recently in 2020, Elsevier has quietly begun to use Threat Metrics on their sites. So Threat Metrics is we know that Threat Metrics is implemented on Science Direct, for example, the platform through which researchers consult the content um, of Elsevier journals. So, Relix connect, uh, collects data of researchers and library patrons for their LexisNexis services. 
And these also include, and this is, um, you can see here, a, a tool called Lex ID, for example, um, through which Relix claims to be able to identify users um, on the internet and through which they claim to have established over 1.4 billion um, uniquely identified citizens, giving it the ability to, as, it, as it's written here, I think, to analyze the innumerable connections between devices, locations, past behaviors, etc. cetera. Um, so how does the process of, of collecting data by publishers um, work, work in practice? And this is not easy to say because the publishers are very, not very transparent, uh, tra not very transparent regarding the data collection practices. And therefore we have to rely on information that can be traced through various tests or that is publicly, publicly available. Um, the DFG, the Self-Governing Organization for Science and Research in Germany, has identified three different methods. First is a third-party tracking through various tools. Um, these include mostly cookies, uh, visit trackers, audience tools for aggregating different data sources into profiles, fingerprinters that identify even those users who seek to prevent the identification uh, through their browsers, browser settings. Those tracking tools are mostly produced by third-party providers um, under contract to the major internet companies, Google and Facebook. And since this data is already institutionally linked to other data collected by these companies, it can be combined with these data and condensed into um, comprehensive profiles. Second method is um, port scanning and bitstream data, and these work without cookies. So for example, threat metrics uses port scanning to, to identify open ports on users' computer and scan their system, for which purpose we don't know exactly. Um, for bitstream data, user data is auctioned on a real-time basis, including a variety of individual items of information, such as localization data, IP numbers, device details, and much more. Um, this is then transmitted and can be linked to an identifier, so this also um, enables these companies to reliably identify individuals. And thirdly, there's, there's, there's um, um, a thing they call spyware, and that is software that is marketed uh, to libraries and um, research in institutions that collects data such as typing speed and mouse movements to be able to identify users despite the use of proxy servers or VPN tunnels. Um, so the DFG also has recently engaged um, in this debate and they have published a briefing paper in fall last year by the Committee of Scientific Library Services and Information Systems. And there it says, and I'll just read it aloud, there is a risk that this shift in the commercial business model towards data analytics will result in the knowledge society becoming more privatized and that ultimately it will no longer be the public sector, but increasingly private companies that are privy to knowledge about research content and trends, its institutions and stakeholders. Um, so what does this mean in terms of fundamental rights? Firstly, it's important to note that public universities and libraries are state bodies and they are therefore bound by fundamental rights. And maybe the most imminent um, fundamental right that is affected is the right to informational self-determination, which includes the right to data protection. So on a first layer, data tracking affects the right to informational self-determination of the individual researchers. In most cases, data tracking by third parties in the context of scientific research does not conform with data protection legislation because the affected individuals are not sufficiently informed um, about this tracking, both if and to what extent personal data is being collected. And even if they consent to the data processing, such as you would do while accepting cookies, um, the consent will in most cases not be legally valid because at least in Europe under the GDPR, consent has to be based on a free decision. But when, for example, a specific article can only be accessed through one portal, and this portal requires the use of, cooking, uh, of cookies, um, this can hardly be a voluntary free decision because this portal has, has sort of a monopoly so that you would factually be forced to accept these um, tracking practices. Another aspect that aggravates the impact um, on the right to information and self-determination is the fact that the, data is, um, that the data that is collected from research activities can be combined with other data and condensed into profiles. So research data is being sold and traded, for example, with data brokers for advertising purposes. Um, some companies um, like Relics also exchange these data uh, with state, state authorities. And in both cases, we have the general problem that there's little to non-transparency about these processes so that neither researchers, universities, or libraries themselves do know to what extent their data is actually being collected. Um, so another very important fundamental right in this context, the right to academic freedom. 
Um, under Article 13 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, uh, academic freedom, is, uh, it says there that acad academic freedom shall be respected. A little more precise in Article 5 of the German Constitution, it says um, research and teaching shall be free. So what does this mean in practice? For individual researchers, it means that they are free to decide what they do their research on and that they do this free from any interference by the state. But it also requires some degree of transparency on the side of the institutions towards employees on how the research process is organized. Because the academic freedom has um, two dimensions, both a subjective and an objective one. The subjective dimension means that individuals can vote academic freedom as their individual right to be protected from external influence. But the objective dimension puts an obligation on the state and its um, institutions to create a framework that protects academic freedom. And we have doubts that this is the case when researchers have no alternative but to share their data when using university services. Um, yeah, let me just go to the next slide. Oh, that's, somehow I cannot open the, ah, yeah, that's the slide I was looking for. Um, and the third problem is that um, universities use data analytics tools that they buy from the publishers and use these for different purposes, for example, for decisions about promotion. And this um, also opens up an equality dimension of this fundamental rights um, aspect. Metrics such as the import factor, uh, impact factor have long since um, been subject of criticism. And the data-driven exploitation of research behavior can also create discrimin discriminatory aspects, namely when these systems are privately run and serve mainly commercial, commercial interests. This may um, reinforce an existing bias, for example, um, when algorithms rank articles by authors in a native language higher than others, because they read and cite each other more often. So their research is considered by an algorithm to be objectively more relevant, which may not be the case. The German Federal um, Constitutional Court describes the core of academic freedom as an autonomous space that is free from external influence. And that can, of course, also mean that there must be a space that is free from external inf um, inf interference by algorithms. Already today, um, several services are optimized for algorithmic evaluation. And it's easy to imagine that in research too, considerations about algorithmic optimization um, will end up determining the way that research results are published, um, rather than the question of what actually would make the most sense in terms of um, uh, research or benefits. So, um, what can we do about it? Um, the first important step is to create awareness for the difficult trade-offs that research institutions face when they decide to cooperate with commercial enterprises in their administration and knowledge management. Institutions should be especially cautious not to take any steps that cannot be reversed later, especially when sharing personal data, because when that is out in the world, it's really not going back in. Um, and this critical awareness that one um, includes that one should also question the usefulness of metrics. We already know that the impact factor often gives a false impression of relevance and the quality of research, but also for any other kind of data, data driven optimization um, that publishers offer to universities, they should question if this is indeed beneficial for research or if it puts the economic interests of these publishers above the needs of, of, of um, universities and their employees. Uh, when it comes to open access, it is important to note that most large academic publishers have come to terms with open access. Instead of selling the access itself to their journals, they have shifted their business model to article processing charges. And the only thing they offer in return is that they provide a platform on which these articles can be published. And by this means, they still exercise control over the publications because the researchers um, have to use these platforms to access the articles, giving the publishers again the possibility to collect their personal data. So for open access, it's important that articles are not only freely accessible, but that they are published under, under free license so that other research institutions can publish these um, informations on their own infrastructures and ide ideally from the very beginning. Uh, one should also be careful when it comes to deals between universities and publishers that link open access with other su subjects. Um, for example, the deal between universities in the Netherlands and uh, Elsevier in that deal, Elsevier granted the researchers um, access to its journals, but in exchange for that, the universities had to agree to use data analytics tools by Elsevier, for example, Pure and its data monitoring services. So these kinds of deals, um, they have uh, a detrimental effect on competition because universities bind themselves to one of the competitors. And they also create an incentive to put these analytics tools that the universities involuntarily buy or, or get um, to practice 
which then turns um, into new dependencies on the same companies. So therefore, one should also be very skeptical when open access is linked to conditions that are not related to the open access itself, such as the purchase of um, certain analytics tools. Um, another important aspect in this context uh, for content that is not open access but is subject to any kind of uh, access restriction is the question who controls the authentication process. Is it the university itself, which in our opinion it should be, um, or do they rely on third party services who serve commercial interests to do so? So research institutions should therefore carefully, uh, clearly reject the use of um, um, spyware in, in, in their networks and also secure this contractually, because otherwise there is a risk that these companies will gain an insight into the internal affairs of um, universities, which from an academic um, freedom point of view should absolutely be avoided. Um, so thirdly and, and lastly, apart from these more technical considerations, there are legal remedies, of course especially under um, European data protection law. So the first step would be an um, information request to actually find out what data is stored and to, to what purposes it is used, um, to either the publisher itself or to the research institutions. And when there is a potential violation of data protection laws, for example, if third party trackers or port scanning happens without consent of the user, there is the possibility to file a complaint to the data protection authority, for example, who have um, sharp swords at their disposal to put an end to a violation of data protection laws. Uh, also, individuals could go directly to a court, court and ask for injunctive relief. This has recently happened in Germany um, at the Rhein-Main University, where a researcher had sued the Rhein-Main University because they had um, used a third-party cookie services, a service which transmitted his personal data to the United States. However, uh, universities should not shift the burden of action to the researchers completely because those kind of complaints, court proceedings, um, et cetera, uh, come with costs and risk and they require a great deal of personal resources, preparation, research, et cetera. And universities or institutions are structurally in a far more better position to ensure a high level of data protection and protect its members. And also to make sure that tracking by third parties is limited in absolute minimum. Um, for example, because they have the possibility to exclude these options um, contractually. Yeah. So these were um, some of the possibilities to fight back that we came up with, and I'm happy to discuss other possibilities with you. Um, yes, lastly, um, thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to, to, to your questions, and um, if you would like to support our work or learn more about or learn more about GFF, you can do this on our webpage, uh, freiheitsrechte.org. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jaska. What a, a really interesting, interesting um, presentation. Got me thinking about a lot of things. We have a few questions that have come in. I'm just going to start off with one quick personal question. I'm a journalist. We deal a lot with the issue of fake news and protecting the information that's out there. When you're dealing with data protection with research, is the idea as we go more and more digitally into saving our information and storing it, is it a big issue also of hacking into the storage of information to say that a country comes in and changes dates on the history books or changes figures and then says based on what's uh, there in, in the storage of libraries, we're going to use that to, to execute our policies? How is that an issue for libraries and data storage? Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. And that rather uh, that pertains to, to the IT security of, of, of the repositories of these institutions. And I think it, it, is, it, is, it is a big issue, but, it's, but as you have mentioned yourself, it's really hard to find, to, to document uh, possible violations of, these, uh, of um, the security provisions and to really find out if somebody got in and had, had changed anything. Um, um, and that of course, that also relates to the question of, of data protection because um, because also personal data is of high end, can be of very high interest that, uh, of, for third party actors. Yeah. Um, but I think um, for our work, uh, we focus, we put a stronger focus on the legal dimensions and what you can do and not the, the technical provisions to, to um, guarantee IT security. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Now I'll just think it out loud there. Good, then let, let's go to our participants' questions. If we can go ahead and blend them in. 
And as I mentioned before, right now I have it on my small screen. Yoshka, can you read that right now? And I'm going to see if I can get my pins yeah. in here. Go ahead, no, please. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, it's, it's too, too small for me as well. I, I for just, you as well. I, okay, let me see what I can do here I, too. I try to, to, to enlarge that. Ah, yeah. Okay. If you have it large, go ahead and read it. Yeah, I just read it out loud. Is yeah. there a kind of white list of services and tools which can be used by researchers offered by universities and libraries? What can you concretely recommend? Um, to my knowledge, unfortunately, there is no such no such whitelist, um, and it really depends um, on the institution and where it's located. As some of my colleagues or researchers they have done um, great work actually discovering which tools are used on which sites, and the results were were rather shocking because on 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 I think on the average. Um, Publishers platform, um, they employed around from around, I think from 85 to 170 third party tools. So that just um, shows the extent to which these tools are used. Um, when it comes to, to which tools could actually be beneficial, which tools you could, you, you could use um, without any data protection concerns, I'd recommend um, um, using software that, is, that would be the best that is either self developed. That, is, that has been um, audited independently and that does not belong to one of the large companies such as um, Google, Meta, Relix, and so on, where you can, where, where it is clear that they use these data to combine it into profiles, which would be the, um, um, the worst impact that you could have. But um, I suggest just to be aware and check every offer you get um, and see what they actually do because those, um, Service providers, they are obliged to disclose to, to what extent they, they process personal data. And it's really important just to insist on that and, and take a look and, and then review it objectively as possible, as good as it gets. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm still trying to get with my page here. Can we have the next question come up and I'll see? What's the first word of that question, Yashka? Uh, What, role, what, should, what uh, role should commercial companies generally play in a future science system? I see that now. Go ahead, please. Yeah, um, that's a big question. Huh? And it, really, it relates to, to the old and big question. To what extent should, should um, research and science um, be, be in the hand of, or be, in the, be, be organized by the state with all uh, its downsides that there are, which funding and organizational deficits that, that, that there may be. And to what, to what extent can, can privatized companies with, with all their resources can, can be of use? Um, and I think um, maybe in that sense, like a competition-based approach could be helpful because from what, we, what we're seeing now is that the academic publishing market, market is, is monopolized more or less. And that at least in Europe, that the state institutions are not willing to do anything about it. And, and in order to make it at least more difficult for these companies to, um, to exploit user, uh, researchers and, and institutions, there has to be some, some level of, of, of competition. Um, in an ideal world, I would say that those companies would not play a role because everything would, would, be, would be a true open access and, and, and for the benefit of all. But in, in, in the system we, we live in now, I think it's, it, it's important to limit their roles as much as we can saying that we are already dependent on these on these enterprises in, in lots of um, areas. Okay, thank you very much. We have our next question here. If we can blend it up there, and I'll go ahead and read it. With regard to threat metrics, does that mean that the data analyst companies, formerly known as publishers, also enrich profiles of academics with other information they gathered about the academic by analyzing their private surfing behavior? Wow, very interesting. Please yeah, go ahead. That, um, with regard to threat metrics, we do not know precisely what, what data they, they gather, but that's exactly what can happen. And that's what they, what they also um, actually are quite open about it, that they think that they do exactly this. That, um, um, for example, Elsevier, um, they say, yeah, 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 we, we use the data that we collect from the scientists, but we use it in an anonymized form and then aggregate it with other data and, and, and sell, uh, trade and sell this. However, um, even if they use the data in an anonymized form, they can still, in combination with other data, such as location data or um, I don't know, IP addresses would have to be anonymized as well, but other data, 
they, they still can identify um, the users, the individual users. So that's exactly what ha what's, what's happening. Um, um, while doing research, you, you contribute to these um, data profiles and they, they combine the data that they pick up from the different spots, private surfing behavior, research activities, and anything else, and, and merge it. Okay, now, thank you very much. Really a, a fascinating question and answer. Uh, we have time for two more questions. Our next one here coming up. Um, what about personalized tracking links and emails, for example, in newsletters from publishers? Boy, we're talking about Big Brother here. Um, also, very good question. Um, and in that case, I'm not sure to what extent you're giving up personal data, but I assume because it's technically possible that they also use this to, to gather the information that is automatically provided by your email program and so on. And, um, and, and link this to every other piece of data they have with you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have time for one final question. We'll see if we can blend that question there. Could you please explain again how data tracking surveillance by private companies threatens to further privatize knowledge and the results of science. I'm trying to understand the logic. Um, yes, uh, okay. That's also, again, a, a rather complex um, question and I'll try to, to make, my, make my point again. It's because um, um, that these companies, they engage all over the research cycle. So, so you, you, when you use their tools, you, you already give them give them a piece of data. And then institutions who make contracts with universities, they usually um, agree to use other tools by the same companies, such as, um, as I have mentioned, Pure. And Pure follows the, then, then follows um, its internal algorithmic logic, for example, to, to organize knowledge, um, to generate metrics. And then it's likely maybe to recommend to recommend um, articles that, that follow their very logic or that um, have been um, created through the use of other tools by the same companies. And if universities keep using that infrastructure rather than developing their own independent infrastructure, they will become more independent um, of these tools and therefore th this will make them less, uh, on the one hand, less independent and on the other hand, um, force them to rely on these third party third party tools therefore thereby contributing to the privatization of of um of science sorry I, i'm not sure if i was completely clear but um i'm happy to discuss this uh, later in the meet the speaker session in our speaker's corner correct you'll be yeah. joining us at 3 15 central european time correct yeah fantastic our time is running to an end but we do have one quick question i found it very interesting i'm going to put it in there real quickly short answer if you can yoshka if you have time, does the Gesellschaft für Freiheitsrechte offer consulting for universities and libraries? Um, unfortunately, we're not personally equipped to do that, but um, you can contact us and we can refer you to some of our colleagues who, who we think are suitable to do this. And, um, but what we can do if, if you have a legal question and you think that, that, that could be um, turning into a case for a strategic lawsuit, you can always contact us and we can evaluate that. Very good, thank you very much. I'd like to give you, even though we're all in front of our computers, a virtual <laughs> applause. Thank you very much for an extremely thought provoking presentation. Thank you all for your questions. Um, really an interesting subject. And I think it's one that you could probably speak on hours about. So for those interested to speak uh, further with Jaska Selinger, a reminder, this afternoon at 3.15, we will have our Meet the Speakers Corner, and we're looking forward to that. Joshua, thank you very much. We're going to move over now thank to our you. second speaker.